any new faces we might have in the audience today. I'm Dr. Tara Griffiths, Chair of the Occupational Therapy Program, and I would like to welcome you to our annual Leader in OT event. This year marks the 19th year for this event. On behalf of the faculty, we are excited to be back face to face and are glad that each of you are here with us in person, despite the weather. Kind of teased us this week. We have a very special guest with us today, our very own AOTA president, Dr. Allison Stover. The Evening with a Leader event has been a tradition here at the university for the past 19 years. This event allows for faculty, students, as well as practitioners to come and participate in occupations of both education as well as social participation. The faculty look forward to bringing leaders in the field of OT to Finley every year and offer quality education at no cost. Over the past 19 years, we have hosted many distinguished leaders, and to name a few, Carolyn Baum, Winnie Dunn, Charles Christensen, Florence Clark, Karen Jacobs, Amy Lamb, Neil Harvison, Ginny Stoffel, Michael Awama, Wendy Hildebrand, and today we will add Dr. Stover to this list. So before we get started, I would like to acknowledge some very important individuals that helped make this event possible. First, I'd like to acknowledge our Dean of the College of Health Professions, Dr. Richard States, and thank him for all of his support. I would also like to thank Dr. Mary Beth Dillon for her past leadership as chair of the program. If she could please stand. <laughs> Next, I would like to thank both of our administrative assistants. With all of their hard work and planning and marketing for this event, we couldn't do it without them. So they were seated out there, probably signed you in, both Amy Yader and Carol Wilford. I also want to thank our IT department for getting all of the technology set for today's event. And I would like to thank the OT faculty for all of their help with the event. Also, three members of our faculty that are responsible for all of the detailed planning that goes into this event, and I'm going to have these um, individuals stand as well, Dr. Rebecca Hare, <laughs> Dr. Lisa Sakemiller, and Dr. Miranda Tippy. And last, I would like to thank our students. And I am sorry I didn't do this last night, but without you, our program wouldn't exist. So if our MOT and OTD students that are here today could stand, please. So this event could, would not be possible without the help and dedication of all of these individuals. Before I hand it off to our PT representative, some light housekeeping for CEU certificates. Within the next few weeks, for those that are attending, you're, you're going to receive a Google survey. And you'll need to complete that. And once you complete the survey, you will be able to print that certificate. For anyone missing this event or unable to attend, or if those of you would like to watch the event again, it is being um, taped and it will, our link will be posted on our website or on our Facebook page. So uh, other um, housekeeping, bathrooms. So bathrooms are located behind this room in the back hallway. If you could exit through the side door um, to avoid, you know, coming up here in front of everybody, that would be great. And then one last request is to silence your phones as a courtesy for all around you. So now I will turn this to our PTE representative, our OTD student, Sydney Fournay, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. We are so excited to have Dr. Stover here at, 
for, at UF for another inspiring topic. Dr. Allison Sover is an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Pittsburgh. She obtained her Juris Doctorate in Law with a postgraduate certificate in Health Law from the University of Pittsburgh. Her areas of practice expertise include pediatrics, trauma-informed occupational therapy, and holistic approaches to substance use disorder. Additionally, Dr. Stover is one of only 20 individuals in Pennsylvania holding AOTA board certification in pediatrics. She owns a private outpatient pediatric practice north of Pittsburgh and co-founded a nonprofit organization that uses occupation to address community, societal, and population needs. She has served as the primary investigator and co-primary investigator on various nationally and state-funded research projects involving screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, or the SBIRT. In addition, she has been involved in SBIRT plus development and training, trauma-informed occupational therapy for the intervention of children who have experienced sexual trauma, and the use of occupational therapy in the treatment of substance misuse. Dr. Sober's interests include using occupational therapy as a powerful driving force for a larger healthcare change, advancing occupational therapy's national and global relevance, and occupational therapy's role as the leader in policy development and implementation. Her clinical passion is an access to care for underserved and underrepresented populations. Dr. Stover commenced her position as president of the American Occupational Therapy Association on July 1st of 2022. The title of this morning's presentation is We Are OT, Realizing Our Past to Propel Our Present and Empower Our Future. Let's give a warm UF welcome to Dr. Stover. Good morning. If you all had the chance to attend Dr. Hildebrand's talk, she probably began her morning with, I'm not a morning person. Um, so I will follow in my predecessor's footsteps and say, I am not a morning person. Uh, so, but I'm happy to be here. You will hear me talk regularly about how important our past, our present, and our future are. And so I hope that today what we take away from this together is an adventure, a journey into occupational therapy's past, which is really what propelled us to the place that we are today so that we can empower what occupational therapy looks like tomorrow. So I said we're going to go on a journey. 2019, how, how many of you remember that year? Feels, feels like it was eons ago, right? <clears throat> In 2019, um, children were standing far too close together, spreading germs freely as though we all wanted to have bronchitis and that wonderful cold that went from third grader to third grader. My daughter's the one in the middle smiling, not singing at all. Um, but my favorite is the young lady over there with her arms crossed like, I am out, people. I do not, I don't sing, I don't dance. Right? Weddings were happening, and we were enjoying them freely, traveling to get to them sometimes, being close to one another, hugging. We were traveling, going to places um, that we lived near to or far from, and it didn't really matter. We weren't putting thoughts into um, what type of, of level they were at in regards to disease transmission or viruses. She picked queen. You know, her mother said Tupac, her father said queen. And we were getting puppies, because why not? So um, that's my, my puppy dog, Denali, when we got him and we were bringing him home. He was just a few months old. We were still doing things that, you know, helped to contribute to the balance that we experience in life. So 
Maybe we were running on a treadmill or running outside or um, just trying to pretend like we were doing okay with that very weird smile I have there. And advocacy was happening in person at the national level, at the state level, at the local level. So when we were doing AOTA Hill Day, we were actually going to the Capitol and uh, having a chance to talk face to face with our legislators about the things that impacted our profession and individuals' ability to access our profession. Do y'all remember that year, 2020? Right? At first it was exciting. Oh my goodness, it had been years since I could be home on a Wednesday, right? Uh, so at first we were kind of embracing it. I had a brand new puppy that I got to be home with most of the time. We started to think about all those things that we didn't have the chance to do, that we now had time to do, like cleaning out your garage, no one person's garage should have that much stuff in it. And saying, finally, I can fit my car in there again. So being thrilled with some of that newfound time to do those things that we had been putting off for so long. We learned that the delivery of our services didn't necessarily have to be face to face. In um, <clears throat> March of 2020, the Pennsylvania governor announced our stay-at-home orders, and at that time our school closures began. We had already been investigating a telehealth platform um, in my clinic because we had a number of individuals that in a rural area just couldn't get to the facility regularly to be in person. We literally did not even have a 24-hour lag in being able to offer a remote service. Of, of care delivery. So we saw this sort of new delivery of care, but, but not that it was new necessarily, but that, hey, it really was effective and we could implement it with immediacy. We saw that we could do a lot of things differently and not necessarily in person. I have to admit, my children are much preferred to church online where they get to eat their cereal and sit in their pajamas on the couch versus in what those pews are that they just can't seem to get comfortable in and someone's nudging them to make sure they're awake. And then we realized there's a reason we leave our house. We can get very bored. And then we also have this opportunity with the time to achieve goals that we hadn't done in the past, like actually getting into that that half marathon at a time that you can feel proud of, that you ran the whole experience. But we were still kind of bored, because now we were really home for a long time. We learned new skills. I never thought that I would know how to cut hair. I also never thought my son would actually let me cut his hair. Um, but we were trying new things and having fun with it. And then we got to a place where we said, I don't care anymore. Just let the dog sit on the kitchen table. It's fine. <laughs> and then I want you all to think about coming out of that place of newness of the pandemic, recognizing the change and living in change for well over 18 months. And coming into that place now where we were accepting places of change that had to remain, other places of change that couldn't be there anymore. And so think about that coming into 2022, last year at this time. Right? So we still found new ways to do things. Sometimes church happened in person again, but with masks. That's my niece. My son's, my son, my daughter, my brother says to me, she was so well behaved, she loved it. And I showed him this picture, I was like, she didn't love it. <laughs> we realized that there were some of the goals that we achieved that were really exciting and fun. And so taking that, that half marathon run to outside was something that we could do now in 2022. And we could do it with other people. Um, 
and in spaces where we hadn't necessarily been able to go for a long time. Y'all might think that that's the puppy that you saw in the first one, but no, no. COVID, I got a second puppy. <laughs> and then a third. Uh, we did return to being able to watch school events in person, and children did not seem to learn that when they sit that closely and breathe on each other, they are spreading everything. We returned to sports um, and being able to attend sports in person. That puppy we got grew up, became 125 pounds, and really thought that he was the ruler of the house. Weddings in person returned, and sometimes they were outdoors, but at least we could still hug one another and enjoy celebrating marriages. We, my son hates that this picture's in here. I said, look, you get to be cute all the time. This is my karma to you. Uh, so we did some of our skills. We continued some of those skills. We recognized that, hey, we weren't that bad at haircuts, and maybe we should keep doing those. We returned to travel, and we did it with a little more emphasis, a little more excitement, a little bit more joy with friends that we hadn't had the chance to travel with before because we were now in a state of more appreciation for this ability to get out. Conference returned to in-person and we were able to yet again meet with our colleagues and our peers and share the community of occupational therapy. We got another puppy, because why not? We did so well with that first one. And they loved each other endlessly, because now that mom and dad and brother and sister couldn't be home with them 24-7, they had each other to snuggle with. So I want to pause right now. This was a little bit of a walk, a journey, an adventure with me about some of my experiences through the beginning of the pandemic, the closures, and what it was like to go through both the experiences of balance in occupation, as well as occupational deprivation, as well as then even thinking about occupational alienation. And I want you to just pause in this this place of disruption. Because that's what comes to mind when I think about the experience that many of us had over 36 months and beyond. We had disruption, disruption in connection. There were so many ways that we could not connect with individuals that we were with all the time. Thanksgiving dinner might have been on our own, disruption in connection. We weren't going out to festivities and events, concerts, sporting uh, games with friends. We weren't able to just hang out with our neighbors, disruption and connection. Pause. Did you experience any disruption in your connections? Think about those. We also experienced a disruption in inspiration. I experienced many disruptions in my inspiration. Many you got to observe there, like my dog falling asleep on my kitchen table and me not caring. I also thought about all the things that I wanted to do, the ways that I wanted to be able to impact my community, the new and novel and innovative treatments that I still had to learn about, the different types of policies that needed to be developed so that access to care could happen, but then it suddenly became just access to emergency care. The idea that if an individual, a family member, a loved one experienced a heart attack, they'd actually be able to get into the hospital, and suddenly it didn't seem so important to know what therapeutic listening was. Did you experience disruption and inspiration? Did goals seem different, not as important? Let's pause. 
we often forget to give space to the disruptions that we experienced. Let's do that now. So, we move forward though, right? And although we experienced these disruptions, we did begin to think about what we needed to do to return to a connection, to redefine ourselves, our values, our goals, and then to re-inspire so that we actually make movement towards them. As we began to move into a space of new normal, what people called, I saw that individuals were struggling regularly with pre-pandemic occupations, things that were so usual in their everyday life. I suddenly don't quite remember how to order in person, seated at a table in a restaurant. I'm not really sure I want to raise my hand in class to answer a question or even to ask to use the restroom. I don't know what to do about that. I'm so visible asking for permission. I saw that people didn't know how to interact with each other, the same people that they had been in a house with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It suddenly felt weird to interact with them outside of that home. People forgot how to grocery shop for the week instead of for the month. People were nervous. They were scared. And I started to ask myself, when faced with disruption, who do we become? And for a long time, I wasn't quite sure. And so I read, and I listened to podcasts. I talked to mentors and met new people. And then I came across this term that really answered the question for me. Reinvention. See, reinventing a profession means understanding what the disruption has done and then adapting your practices to encompass what we have learned from the disruption. According to an article by Hayes in 1996, reinvention assumes a dynamic, constantly evolving process. And I thought, wow. I could easily exchange reinvention for occupational therapy. Occupational therapy means understanding what the disruption has done and then adapting our daily life to encompass what we have learned from the disruption. Occupational therapy assumes a dynamic, constantly evolving process. Think about the very early stages of occupational therapy, where we began. We were developed in the roots of psychiatry by a psychiatrist. Mental health was at the forefront of every treatment. And then wars happened, more wars. And suddenly, our space, the necessity for us to move into the world of biomechanics became imperative. So what did we do? We evolved. We adapted. We remained dynamic. And then we saw, we saw that the value of rehabilitation was so highlighted, so recognized, and we saw reimbursement reflecting that. And then we saw the Balanced Budget Act. And in the 90s, many people feared what that meant for our profession, for their very own jobs. But what did we do? Well, occupational therapy, see, we remained dynamic. We evolved. We redefined occupation for those who didn't understand the term. So if we could do that for the past over 100 years, why could we not do that now? Well, I knew we could and I knew we would. I just wanted us to do it for more than our profession. I wanted the world to see that we all needed to come to a place of reinvention and the very team to lead those efforts was the occupational therapy community. So, I had to dive a little bit deeper into reinvention. 
before I fully committed this idea that this is what we are, this is what we do, this is our past culminating in our present to empower our future. And so I learned a little bit more about the factors that influence reinvention. So social learning is when we learn from previous experiences of ourselves and others. And then we make changes based on this learning. And I thought, my goodness, this is literally occupational therapy daily, right? Do we not ask our clients as they sit down in the very first evaluation with us, what is it that you like to do? What is it that you are no longer able to do? We're constantly comparing previous experiences. So I thought about it, and who do we learn from? We learn from our consumers. They are the ones who tell us what occupations are, which ones are most important, which ones have the biggest experience of barriers. We learn from our consumers, but then I thought, wait, we learn from ourselves as well. How many times have we paused and read through an article or looked on a blog written by an occupational therapy professional and thought, ah, oh, you get it. Thanks for helping me find that answer. And we also in social learning ask, what has our past taught us? Occupational therapy has been asking this question regularly since the very beginning. What has our past taught us? Recently, I had the great privilege of helping to start to uh, reorganize and realign the Wilma West Library and Archives at the National Headquarters in Bethesda. And it was interesting. We were talking, and, and at that point, um, Boston University had just brought on their new chair. And their new chair was something, someone to talk about because she wasn't an occupational therapy professional. She was in public health. And we were talking about this, this great relationship that occupational therapy and public health should have, and why are we taking this long to start to form and, and highlight and, and market this, this very relationship. And as we were having this great conversation in sweatpants on the floor, looking through all of our history, I came across a journal from 1932. You know what that journal article said? Occupational therapy's role in public health. See, our past has taught us that we, we were always on the right track and we shouldn't veer from it. That there are strong elements of our history that will forever remain the strongest elements of our present and our future. But our past has also taught us that far too often we are the collaborator but not the leader. We are willing to do the work but never take the, the credit. Then, then social learning also tells us what can we learn from our global community. And never before have we on such a large screen been able to recognize and see that we shared in experiences with our global community. How many of you remember early on in, in the pandemic that news story of the city in Italy that people just started to play music on their balconies and everybody was enjoying this great concert that was happening just organically, naturally, right? We were learning from our global community that connection, occupational participation, was what was bringing about wellness, joy, a smile, whether we were personally engaged in it or just hearing the story. And always returning back to what do we learn from our consumers? So see, we reinvent innovations to meet the demands of our specific needs and experiences. But we forget to recognize, we fail to tell the world that that's not new for occupational therapy. That's what we've done from the very beginning. That is our past, our present, and our future. So I started to think about this a little bit more. And in an article from, um, from 2020, Hansen and Smallwood say 
that you must position your organization uh, early and you need to anticipate the need for revival. Instead of reacting and then to, to something during the decline. So see, what we need to do, where we need to change, the reinvention that needs to happen is this idea that we can no longer be reactive to the disruption. Instead, we must become predictive of where the disruption may occur. And we must anticipate the need for revival, the need for participation. Because if we continue to react, we won't be able to really support and empower our future. We won't be able to take the lead and provide the wellness that occupational therapy has known how to do for over 100 years. So I love quotes. Um, my husband gets me every year one of those tearaway calendars. And pardon my language, but it is badass quotes from badass women that I get every year. Um, and so they are generally uh, quotes from various women that I know and some that I don't and have the chance to meet and explore in my research. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It's going to be hard, but because you've picked something you're passionate about, you're going to enjoy the journey. And I've never before been able to sum up my experience my adventure in occupational therapy so concisely, so concretely, so well as this quote. See, it is hard. Our profession is hard. We're not doing something that everybody can do. We are utilizing a lens that others do not have. It is difficult. We carry the stories, the lived experience of every consumer that we encounter in addition to our own lived stories and our neighbors lived stories and our loved ones lived stories and it's hard it's so hard but how do you not find the passion for this profession it's exciting it's problem solving it's healing it's wellness it's holistic it's person first it's client-centered. It's individualized, and yet at the same time can bring about the most effective way to bring health and wellness and access to entire populations. See, it is something that you can be passionate about. And so I've never once not enjoyed this journey. Well, what does reinvention then look like in practice? We can hear about it now, but, but that's a lot of theory. And, and I was often that student who did not sit in the front row, but rather closer to the back, who wanted to say, I'm tired of hearing about theory. What do I do? What's the, what's the tool I can put in my tool bag? What is the trick that I can do to actually make this realized? And I found a framework that actually comes from the Appreciative Inquiry Framework. The Appreciative Inquiry Framework is not new. Um, it's, it's older, but it's largely been used in business models. It's been used to help develop individuals who are in administrative positions, understand how to um, eliminate, minimize, or even uh, solve crisis or conflict within a business setting. And the framework really has four areas that you come from. Disaster, discovery, design, and destiny. And although this has largely been utilized in a business world for managers and administrators, I found that it aligns very nicely with occupational therapy, with reinvention, with recognizing the power of our past to get us to where we are today so that we may empower our future. So step one, name the disaster. The disaster, or, or another term that I've used that I like to call disruption. Okay, let's name it. On January 1st, 2022, 
Medicare outpatient services provided by occupational therapy assistants and physical therapy assistants began receiving a 15% reduction in payment. This cut was separate from and in addition to other cuts to the therapy payments under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule that have been imposed over the last two years. This reduction especially threatens access to care in rural and underserved areas where a higher percentage of services are provided by occupational therapy assistants and physical therapist assistants. It's a disaster. Or what about the disaster of the proposed 2023 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule? This proposes a 4.2% cut, and the conversion factor would add to the cuts that we already experienced in 2020 and 2021. They call these cuts a budget neutrality requirement, but what it really does is cause significant disruption to the healthcare system without any regard for patient outcomes, provider resources, provider wellness, burnout, or any other policy. Name the disaster, the disruption. There are many barriers to the provision of occupational therapy services for someone with a mental health diagnosis under Medicare and Medicaid where these services are already allowed, just not for the psychosocial treatment of an individual that needs it. According to research published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, since the COVID-19 pandemic, average life expectancy is down by one year for everyone. However, for our black and Latino neighbors, this reduction is four times higher than in our average. According to NIMH, 24.5% of women have been diagnosed with a mental illness versus 16.3% of men. According to the National Cancer Institute, individuals who have experienced less opportunity in education from any race are more likely to die from colorectal cancer before the age of 65. Can you think of disasters or disruptions that you've personally experienced with your neighbors in your community? I think identifying and naming the disaster is not hard. Most recently in the state of Pennsylvania, we had one of our largest private payers come to us. They were reducing payment reimbursement for occupational therapy, physical therapy, and chiropractic services. They were day capping occupational therapy services at $72, physical therapy services at $92. These are services that were largely being reimbursed anywhere between $150 and $210. This was a more than 50% cut to outpatient clinics providing OT and PT. The disasters, they're not hard to find. And they don't stop happening. But I don't like to stay in the gray. I'm not one that likes to be in the thunderstorm very long. I'm a realist, I recognize that there's disaster, but I'm an occupational therapist and I know that you don't ever have to live or remain in the disaster. There's always something we can do to get to a better place. And so step two becomes a much more exciting place to be and that's the place of discovery. See, reinvention requires us to know the details. It requires us to know the details of the disaster it requires us to understand the details of where we want to go in the process of discovery. It will require our response to emerge from evidence. And the evidence doesn't exist just in our classrooms. The evidence exists in the experience. The experience of the occupational therapy professional, of the occupational therapy scientist, of the consumer of occupational therapy. In the stage of discovery, 
We are focusing on collecting data, but we are not relying only on one group within our profession to be responsible for collecting data. Instead, in Discovery, we are calling upon every member of our community to collect data. Data that can serve as a well-rounded base for the next step. Reinvention requires us to report on success, and without collecting the data, we'll never know if we succeeded. So what do we do during this discovery process? We identify our stakeholders. Our stakeholders must be inclusive of our entire community. Students, future potential students, educators, faculty, staff, clinicians, occupational therapy scientists. These are all stakeholders within our community alone. We must also think about our communities, our neighbors, our consumers, payer sources, policy makers, referral sources. We then must be very articulate, concrete, and specific, intentional. What is included in the data? What are the measures that we are looking for? Outcomes become so important. Name them, say them often and regularly. And as we collect this data, we must work as a group, as an entire population, to analyze what that data is telling us. Step three, design. So I spoke a lot about design last night. That was a, a very primary component of my talk, was how do we design then these responses, these occupational therapy solutions to the disaster, the disruptions that we're feeling, experiencing, and seeing. So in design, we must identify the themes that emerge the themes that emerge within our consumers, the themes that emerge within ourselves. Look at things like the triple aim and how we've really morphed to understand that a quadruple aim is necessary. In that triple aim, we had thought about consumers and the experience of health and wellness, but we forgot to think about ourselves. And the quadruple aim, we add clinician wellness. In the quintuple aim, in the quintuple aim, we add health equity. So we must identify those themes, like health inequity, like clinician wellness. And then we must produce frameworks for implementation. We must also produce the evidence by collecting the data, analyzing the data, and then, most importantly, something that we as occupational therapy professionals often neglect to do, we must disseminate the knowledge, take credit for the work that we have done. I think about the work of Deborah Young that I mentioned yesterday in Delaware, working for the government in the development of emer emergency response procedures for the entire state. Deborah always introduces herself first and foremost as an occupational therapist. She signs OTR slash L on, dis on planning for the state. And then there's this great podcast, The Uncommon OT. And just listening to some of the episodes demonstrate how occupational therapy professionals all over the country are designing opportunities to reinvent our profession in a way that we are producing something meaningful for the population and for ourselves. Megan Blau talks about being adaptive design consultant and an interior decorator. Laura Park Figuerera talks about occupational therapy in pediatric nature-based entrepreneurship. Sarah Zara talks about occupational therapy in podcasting. Krista Fromm, she talks about occupational therapy in copywriting. 
And Angela Fuentes has an excellent episode on occupational therapy and telehealth with refugees and immigrants in schools. I could go on and on and on. What I hope is not that you just hear innovation coming from these individuals in these topics, but that instead you hear reinvention. This is not completely new to our profession. These individuals are not going out on their own doing something that occupational therapy has never heard of. They are taking our lens that has been developed over 100 years ago and applying it to the present needs to empower the future experiences. See, what these individuals are doing, what I talked about last night, what I continue to believe is that the marrying of our past with our roots is the only way we can meet the demands of today and ensure that they don't exist again tomorrow. Step four, destiny. This is a step I like to live in. This is, this is that step that, that really says, where are we going? Where do we want to be? What is the goal, the outcome of all of this? So in destiny, the appreciative inquiry framework tells us that we must focus on three main things. One is empower, empower reinvention through implementation, regulation, and legislation adoption. Statistics say that it takes anywhere between 10 and 14 years for research to be implemented into regular practice. Students, don't let that happen. Read that article and then do it. Try it. Show the clinical world that that evidence is meaningful right now, not in 14 years. Talk to your legislators. Let them recognize how important, how valuable, how necessary occupational therapy is. Get them familiar with our profession before we even ask for recognition and legislation or policy or regulation change. I met um, the, the state rep, so in the Pennsylvania House, the state rep for Mercer County for a long time was a man named Mark Longietti. Mark recently just um, decided he wasn't going to run again, and so he's, after, I think, 14 years, no longer in that role. But when I met him, um, I, I asked for a meeting. I just wanted to see where he stood on things and understand him better. I was new to the area, and I needed to know my rep. And so I had a meeting with him. And then he gave me the opportunity to talk about occupational therapy, the passion that I had behind it and the profession that, that I love. And at the end, he said, wow, I, you know, there's so much I learned from you. I, I learned that occupation means more than a job. I learned that I need to participate in occupations that are meaningful and purposeful, at least 51% of my day. I learned that, that this sense of doing, being, is actually the path to wellness that we don't have to get well to do. We can do in order to get well. And this is incredible. I just have one question. And I said, oh my goodness, OK, what is it? And he said, well, if you do all of that, why do we need any other healthcare profession? And I said, well, you said it, not me. I don't, <laughs> can't answer that. Next, we think about the idea of promotion. We must promote what we are doing. We must promote the implementation. We must promote the reinvention. We must promote the value. One of the things that we have learned from our past is that we are a brilliant profession. We are leaders. We are the missing puzzle piece. We are the final completion of the picture. And yet, we always stand in the corner. Great work, team. Couldn't have done this without you. We must stop thinking that it is not 
our lens that has contributed to the success, and we must loudly boast, yes, boast, about what that lens did. We must share the value of our profession with anyone who's willing to listen and those who aren't willing to listen either. We must not talk about ourselves within the context of other professions and in comparisons, yet instead say we cannot be compared to other professions. There is none like us. We are not PT except. We are not social work and also. We are occupational therapy, different from anything or anyone that exists. And then we must sustain this reinvention. And this is where we must think about the idea that we can never forget to assess, analyze, and evaluate where we are and what we do. Continuous quality improvement is not just something that we help our consumers to do in their own lives. It's something that we must do within our profession and then share. We must continuously evolve. We must be committed to remaining agile. This has always been a strength of our profession, and it is needed now more than ever. Think about your own experiences during the pandemic. Think about ways that you were able to adapt. Think of simple things, simple in quotes, that you did to minimize the disruption for yourself and for others around you that didn't come naturally to anybody else. That came to you because of your occupational therapy training. Remember to remain agile. Remember to look for the disruptions and the disasters. All right, so I'm a Pete's therapist. Stand up, everybody. It's morning. I don't really, I told you all, I'm not a morning person. All right. Just kind of shake it out, move your head around, take some stomps. Use the restroom if you need to. Just move your body. I tell you, there's water up here for you if you need it. <laughs> All right, I hope you all were able to move and get a little bit of, of blood flowing and energy back into you. I, I always like a good shake break. Uh, if, if you all attend um, um, annual conference, you'll find we have like salsa dancing, right? Like what other profession is like, we, so we need to integrate salsa dancing and a conga line into our annual conferences, right? Like, it's us, because we know that's what you need. <laughs> All right. So, the whole, one of the whole purposes that we really move to this space, that we talk about it, is, is that there's this end goal of reconnection, right? That's where we started, this, this place of disruption. And we wanted to get back to a place of reconnection. How do we reconnect? I recently purchased Jonathan Stahl's new book. It's called Walk, Slow Down, Wake Up, and Connect at one to three miles per hour. I learned about this book from one of my favorite authors and a Lutheran pastor, Nadia Boltzweber. If you've not read her book, Accidental Saints, I've now just recommended two for you. In 2010, Jonathan Stahls took his dog, 
who was a Husky Blue Healer mix, and he began his 242-day walk across the United States. In his collection of essays in this book, Stahls explores walking as waking up, how his cross-country journey opened new avenues for renewal, connection, and change. In describing his book, Stahl says, Walk is an urgent and glorious call to slow down, look around, and engage with the world in front of us. It awakens us to what we miss when we're driving by, flying over, and rushing past what surrounds us. It's an invitation to move, to connect, to participate deeply in the world, and to, and to dissolve the barriers that disconnect us from each other and from this living earth. See, Stahls reminded me about intentional reconnection, but he also eloquently described exactly how occupational therapy brings about reconnection. See, it slows us down so that we can awaken. So that we can awaken, but it doesn't mean that we stop. We're doing it as we walk. We're invited to move. We invite others to connect. We invite, we help, we support participation. Deep, meaningful, purposeful participation in the world. We dissolve barriers. We eliminate disconnection. We reconnect. So I got excited and I thought, in all this space where I felt so disconnected, it was in me all the time to know how to reconnect. I just needed to use my occupational therapy lens. And so I started to think about reconnection. And I said, where, where do I go? How do I do this again? What do I do to be intentional about my reconnection? And I remembered that first, first I must return to those occupations that I did on my own those occupations that were the most meaningful to me. So I ran with my dog again, remembering that reconnection wasn't just one element of the occupation, but all of them. But I also recognized that in order to truly reconnect, I could not just return to the occupations that were most meaningful to me, but I needed to add knowledge and information. I needed to connect with individuals who had lived experiences far outside of my own, and so I read a lot. I also thought about reconnection, meaning this idea that I needed to connect to the people who were most meaningful to me. And I needed to make sure that those people knew that they were the most meaningful to me. I still had to participate in those occupations that were preferred new, or just completely done for want only. So yes, I still binge watch very terrible shows and podcasts. Some of them are better than others. A little bit high quality uh, material versus just entertainment value. I recognized that I could attend and participate in my occupations in new and old ways. Attending church in person, as well as attending church on the couch, eating my cereal in my pajamas. I recognized that there were things that I did in isolation that I enjoyed and I could use to funnel reconnection by doing them with others. I remembered why I started the clinic. 
and began to think about the plans, the goals, the projects that I had before I was disrupted. So see, I connected to myself first. I explored myself first. What were the occupations that I need to do? What are the occupations that I was expected to do? What are the occupations that I wanted to do? And was I ensuring that balance, balance for me, was a priority? Then, after reconnecting with myself, I recognized that I needed to reconnect in other ways. So I must inform myself, inform myself beyond what my lived day-to-day -day experience was like, beyond the lived experience of my neighbor, my consumers, my family, and my friends. So I started to read the newspaper, watched news stations that I had not previously watched, signed up for informative podcasts, See, it's not easy to start reconnection if we are isolated in our knowledge. We must inform ourselves of things known and unknown. We must inform ourselves of things we agree with as well as those we disagree. We must be comfortable in having that knowledge and hearing that message. Then, I decided another great way to reconnect was not just about reconnecting with myself, not just about having myself reconnect with the, the views and the occupations and the information of the world around me, but to also provide an experience and opportunity for the world around me to reconnect with me. Look how cute my daughter used to be. She was so nice then. She's not, she's not nice anymore. We didn't actually know she was going to be on the cover of this local magazine. And my mother-in-law called. She opened her newspaper in that magazine. She was like, "Did you, uh, my granddaughter's on the cover. I was like, what? I thought she was just getting in trouble. Um, so we need to be part of telling the story. De telling the story of occupational therapy. Defining it for others not allowing others to define it for us. How many of you have watched the local news lately? I watch the local news, and one of the things that never ceases to amaze me, and, and, and I actually get an Ohio station, um, is that there's, I have counted about three stories over the course of the hour and a half that I'm actually hearing, right? They're like, today, top news, Kenny Pickett drafted for the Steelers. Okay, that's, that's, that's cool. Okay, so uh, did we tell you yet that Kenny Pickett was drafted for the Steelers? And later, at 11 o'clock tonight, breaking news, Kenny Pickett drafted by the Steelers, right? It's the same stories over and over again. They're looking for information to share. They, they want it. They're, they're searching for it. Give it to them. Let them hear about what you are doing. Hey, this small clinic in rural Mercer County was the first clinic in the entire county and three surrounding counties to implement telehealth in the pandemic. Oh, and by the way, the, the clinical director of that county wrote the OT and PT and speech executive order for the governor related to telehealth in Pennsylvania. It's exciting. Oh, and by the way, she's an occupational therapist. What? An occupational therapist wrote an executive order for the governor? Sounds like a story. They're ready. They're willing. They're waiting for you to tell what you are doing. And what you are doing each and every day is news. It feels like your job, your profession, your obligation, your responsibility. It's natural. It's what you studied to do, what you wanted to become. And it's news. Exciting. Meaningful. 
reconnecting news. In this reconnection, we learned that we must integrate our past and what we currently experienced. So we found that engaging online wasn't necessarily a bad thing and could promote opportunities of connection that we hadn't before been participating in. That relative that lived across the country or in a different country was able to attend Thanksgiving dinner via Zoom and an iPad with their own chair at the dinner table. We mustn't forget about those things. Parents who were struggling with online school, particularly for a child that had attention deficits, they learned that they weren't alone in their online communities where other parents were also sharing these same experiences. See, that engagement online showed that we can connect. But we cannot forget that engaging offline is important as well. Become intentional about being in person. Become intentional about finding a new way to engage offline that you never had before. Show up at the school board meeting just to hear what your local school district is doing. Look for grassroots organizations. If there's anything we recognize, we know that people really did want to have meaning and purpose, something the occupational therapy community has always known. But we also found that when we don't have an intentional meaning and purpose, not only does that contribute to disruption in our wellness, but it starts to make us feel even more isolated. So look for those grassroots organizations that share the values of occupational th therapy, that share the mission, the beliefs, the goals. How can you become involved with these organizations? How can you make them informed about occupational therapy while also moving forward in a meaningful outcome? Reconnect sometimes means connecting where there wasn't a connection before. Volunteer. How do we learn about our community? How do we know what others' lived experiences are but through opportunities to share narratives? And there's never been an easier opportunity to hear the narratives of others than through volunteering within various different programs in our community. People now more than ever have needs that they are expressing. Let's show them that we are willing to fill them. But while we're filling them, they want, we want to hear them. We want to learn their narrative. Connect with your neighbors. Connect with yourself. Connect with new people all through the experience of volunteering. And through volunteering, show, demonstrate, exhibit the distinct value of occupational therapy. Because see, you never put away your lens. You're never not a member of the occupational therapy community. You will always leave a process better than when you entered it. I would be remiss if I did not talk about the meaning, the importance, and the value of getting involved with your professional associations and your political action committees. Yes, the Ohio Occupational Therapy Association should have your membership. They need it in order for you to have the practice, the ability, the autonomy to live occupational therapy. It must be well represented in your state, and the best people to do that are the Ohio Occupational Therapy Association. Join and be a member of AOTA. We can only represent the needs 
the, the passion, the value of our profession if we know it and we know it through membership. We were talking yesterday. I can't... Uh, I was talking with PTE. I can't... Where'd she go? There you are. What? I was looking for you over here. Nope, that's all right. You've been an art teacher in the past. And we were talking about professional associations, and she mentioned that in, in her role as an art teacher, there wasn't a professional association that was like a family. <laughs> Our professional associations are like a family. I always say going to annual conference is like coming home for Thanksgiving dinner. I can fight with a brother I haven't seen in a long time. I can hug a cousin that I've missed. The only people who get me are in our, my professional association. You belong. Whether you're a member now or not, whether you were a member before or not, Ohio Occupational Therapy Association, AOTA, we say to you, you belong. Just because you are occupational therapy, we're home. And we're never going to be mad long. We can't make movement without our political action committees. They are the ones that build the relationships and ensure our representation in meaningful and necessary legislation and regulation. It is through the political action committees we ensure that the right people are making the decisions and the right people are the people who value occupational therapy. And so... We must be involved, and being involved can be what it is in your life right now, what you have the space for, membership, reading the newsletter, volunteering for an event, volunteering to be the president. It was funny when I first told my family, I think I'm going to run for president of AOTA. Uh, my daughter said, um, <laughs> but I like President Wendy. And I said, thanks, kid. She's like, well, i got to vote for President Wendy. And I'm like, well, I'm glad that A, you can't vote, and B, President Wendy can't run again. So thanks for the support, kid. She does love her President Wendy. Um, my son said, does this mean I get to travel with you? Um, because I'm well aware that occupational therapy has a lot of females in it, and I would like to meet them. And my husband said, oh, I think that sounds great. It's not like you'll actually win. So this is wonderful. <laughs> and then I did win, and I don't know what happened. The, the three of them didn't talk to me for a couple of days. I think they were processing. Um, but in the end, look, it doesn't, right? I'm a mom, not a great one. I'm trying to be. I'm a wife. I love my dogs. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm a business owner. I'm an advocate. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm an aunt. I'm a sister-in-law. I'm a lot of things. And, and none of them, none of them say I can or can't contribute to this profession. It is my passion and my love for occupational therapy that says, hey, our organizations need you, and each of you have a passion and a love for our profession. And so our organizations need you in any capacity that you can participate. So find those ways. Raise your hand. Volunteer. Be a member. Be a leader because, see, occupational therapy, our lens in and of itself, it makes us natural for these roles. And then, and then we must redefine. We must think about, we've reconnected with ourselves, with others. We've become belonging. We... We know where we can go and how to understand the experiences of others. So now we must 
take this opportunity to redefine occupational therapy, not for us, but for all the rest of the world that doesn't truly recognize our deep, distinct value. So I think about occupational therapy in 2019, and I think about the way that many people recognized or defined occupational therapy outside of our community. They knew that we worked with children, that we had things like ball pits and hand fidgets, they recognized that when their grandmother had a stroke or was experiencing some early decline from dementia, that we came in and we supported their ability to do things that they needed to do. That's, that's how the world really understood occupational therapy in 2019. And it wasn't a bad definition. It was just a very limited definition. Many of you have um, been familiar with our, our process and the occupational therapy framework in our domains. See, achieving health and well-being is a topic of even more conversations than usual. And although the understanding of occupational imbalance is improving for society as a whole, the appreciation of occupational participation in this journey is still overlooked. We recognize what happens to us now when we can't do. But we still are not a society as a whole that understands that it is the participation, the satisfied participation, that is meaningful. Most healthcare professionals see that health and wellness is an avenue to support and promote an individual's ability to participate in everyday activities. However, occupational therapy professionals see the doing, the doing of everyday activities, particularly those that are meaningful and purposeful, as the path to achieving wellness. We see the doing as a means to becoming well versus the becoming well so that we can do. This is still so undefined in our society. See, they recognize that we're not well when we don't do, but they still think we have to get well to do. They don't know that it's actually in the doing that we become well. I think often about the article that was released in 2016. The only profession that we spend more money in, in an acute care setting, that reduced readmissions was occupational therapy. Because it is in the doing we get well, not getting well to do. We must make this a central theme, core to the defining of occupational therapy today and moving forward. So we reconnect, we redefine, all for what? All for the opportunity to re-inspire. So what do you think of when you hear the word re-inspire? I think of Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan, two women who inspired us to think about individualizing education to meet people where they are. And that when we actually do that, the world will benefit from the brilliance that emerges from the student. Re-inspire, I think of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa inspired us to see all people as humans deserving of love and acceptance. All people. I think about inspiration and I think of Stacey Abrams and her efforts to re-inspire individuals to vote in Georgia. See, inspiration is still happening. We see it happen in the past and in the present. 
We can be the inspiration in the future, the inspiration for achieving wellness, justice, equity in our society. But how is it that we re-inspire? Well, we must first enter a space of intending to be inspired. In order to inspire, we must want ourselves to be inspired. Can you think of a consumer, a client, that inspired you to do your job better? to be different. We then must review the world around us. We must investigate and analyze where inspiration is lacking, where inspiration is needed, where barriers exist. We must remind others that inspiration is not something that goes away eternally but instead is something that we can recapture if we want to. And so we must remind through learning and educating others about inspiration, about what inspires us. We must recreate. We must use terminology that is meaningful to the individual, the audience that we're speaking to. We must recreate what occupational therapy looks like in the eyes of those who only understand us in comparison to another profession or standing at a bedside. We must be empathetic. One of the very easy ways to inspire others is to demonstrate our empathy for them, with them. I think about the therapeutic um, relationship process. And empathy is something that we integrate into the therapeutic relationship process from day one. It's something we learn in our foundations course. It's something that we require of every community member in the occupational therapy profession. Being empathetic isn't new, but intentionally highlighting our empathy is inspirational. We must practice gratitude, grateful for our highs and our lows, grateful for the lessons that we learned, grateful for the times we didn't take the credit, grateful for the times we compared ourselves to other professions, grateful for the failures for the clients that we just couldn't seem to bring to a state of wellness. Grateful for everything. Grateful for the privilege to have this knowledge, this education, this profession as a part of who we are. And we must be authentic. We cannot speak from a place of inauthenticity. It's so obvious. We must be sure that when we speak, we are speaking truly from ourselves. See, these are the ways that we can work to re-inspire the world around us. The more opportunities that individuals have in their reconnection and redefining of occupational therapy to encounter empathy, gratitude, and authenticity the more likely they are to be as inspired by our profession as we. We must do this, this re-inspiration, all through our appreciative inquiry. We must design, develop, and disseminate our vision, our work, our day-to-day. -day. And we must show this through our every action. So, I ask you now, will you join me on this journey, this exciting journey of reconnection, reinvention, re-inspiration? Will you be a member of the occupational therapy family?
coming home to fight with me at annual conference or to give me a hug or to go get as much free food as possible at the expo when it opens? Will you be the reason that someone else's whole world is shifted and changed because you've been able to reconnect, reinvent, and re-inspire wellness for them. So thank you, and I am happy to take questions at this time. Dr. Stover, thank you. I, I honestly resonate and appreciate everything you've said, and I feel re-inspired just by listening to you. And I hope the students do, too. Um, I, I just want to, I don't have a question. I just, I'm an educator, too, so I, I have to say something, right? <laughs> you know, so um, Dr. Dillon and I um, are on our local Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board, um, where great work is being done. And people, even in this community, don't realize that much of the work here is being recognized nationally, which is awesome. Um, and and I, I'm glad that out of 18 board members, two of us are OTs, you know, which is awesome. Um, I, I But listening to you made me realize how Occupational therapy, while present and involved in our community, needs to expand so much more and be part of all these uh, collaborative efforts which are already happening. Um, so there are always places for students, too, to come to board meetings or uh, other um, community agencies and, and see what's going on there. Um, and one other thing, I just want to mention that um, your talking this morning brought up to me um, was that I like uh, and I liked was the idea of predicting disasters and stuff and an example for instance which we all need to be aware of everywhere wherever you practice um, is that the COVID money that was given to families at I think the end of this month or next very soon is going to be significantly decreased, which is going to mean more homelessness, less food, difficulty with rent, you know, all those problems that people already had magnified way, way larger, you know. So, you know, there's um, a disaster waiting to happen. So we need to, we need to think about those things and do something, because we can. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for all of that and for those great ideas and suggestions. I can't, I can't agree with you more. You know, we talk often. Homelessness is not new. Individuals being unhoused is not new. Um, but when I look through the OTPF, our Occupational Therapy Practice Framework, how many of our ADLs and IADLs are related to things that we do in the home? So, yeah. If we think about who should be in the place to disrupt a system that has not yet been able to support individuals who are unhoused, it's us. And, and sometimes that means creating how somebody gets to do those ADLs successfully in a place that is a shelter or a place of safety or one room. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of disruption that we are experiencing and we are going to experience. And it's our obligation to be a part of doing and wellness through those. So thank you. And thank you for your work on the board for drug and alcohol. Dr. Silver, thanks for your talk today. And I just want to, sh to say that I share with you the belief in the power of telling the story. As many in this room who know me know I do that all the time. 
<clears throat> what strikes me, though, in listening to you, um, as we think about the power of those stories that we can tell about the work that we do, is how do you, um, when people say to you, the stories don't matter, that's just anecdotal. How do you um, respond to that when they say, show me the evidence, show me the data, show me the outcomes? In many ways, I believe, I think like you, that the power in those stories is, is even more important than some of that outcome data. But how do you respond on sort of the larger scale that you find yourself at places where people might want that kind of information? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, the, in a, in, I let them know that that is the outcome and that is the data. So one of the ways that I do it, particularly with legislators, is I bring it back to the idea that I can give you data, I can show you the evidence, or I can tell you more about your own constituents, the people who are voting for you, the people who care about the decision you're going to make, the people who aren't reading the evidence but do live next door to the man who died by suicide. So I can tell you the evidence or, or I can bring it to you or I can have it emailed to you in any capacity that you want. But what I can't email you, what I can't send you later, is the story that I lived through with another person. That's what I can only do through me, and I'm here right now. And so I'll get you the evidence. You tell me how you want it, and I'll be sure to have it to you. But right now, the thing that I can't get to you later is the narrative, the narrative of, of your neighbors, the narrative of your constituents, the narrative of what everybody in our community sees as evidence. And that really does... It bring, I'll never be able to tell the story any other way but in person with you. And it really does then shift the idea. And I do it for legislators most often, but I've done it with administrators too in the, the context of, you know, we talked, um, I had a conversation with the CEO of a hospital that had closed down their labor and delivery area and um, their labor and delivery place. And so we didn't have... Um, so you have to go pretty far to deliver a baby. And um, I said, you know, we, we closed that down. Why did we do that? Like, and he said, look, you know, we have a lot of babies that are born exposed to drugs. And we just, like, we didn't have the support. Like, I don't know. I didn't have the nurses that were trained in it. I didn't have the staff that was ready for that. And I said, okay, so then, like, can we take a look then of what is happening? Because what is happening is your ER department's delivering babies. Because actually, these women, they can't get somewhere else. They can't get the 45 minutes to Youngstown. They can't get the hour and a half to Pittsburgh to deliver a child. They can get here. And so what you did was you didn't, you didn't shift it. You didn't make it so that you don't have this problem anymore. You just put it on a different set of staff, right? So it's still being able, you can share the story anytime. You just have to emphatically let them know that that's the only thing you can do in person. You can share the evidence later. Hello. Hello. So a topic that I am very interested in personally is looking at inclusion, which you know we know as um, inviting others into a space that we've created and taking that even just a step further into belonging in which we allow our clients and individuals to create that space with us and make them more comfortable there. And as occupational therapists, I believe that's something we'll have an expertise in is meeting our clients where they're at. So I've really enjoyed hearing about your experiences and how you've been able um, to, to meet people at those places of their lives. And I was wondering if you just had another uh, narrative or two you'd like to share with us where um, you've taken that extra step to create not only an inclusive space, but a space of belonging for them. Wow. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I probably have a million and none all at the same time. Um, the, I think the, the biggest thing about being 
inclusive and, and, and creating a sense of belonging that we often neglect to, to recognize is being cautious and being non-judgmental. So I, um, I remember working with a mom who, um, who had been using heroin, but we were working together at the methadone clinic. She had already had her, her child, and um, she was talking to me about, she had five children to four different men, and she'd said to me, um, like she still said it in the way that she condemned herself, right? She's like, well, I got five kids to four different men, and the only reason that they're not to five different men is because two of them are twins, so they had to be from the same guy, you know? And, and, um, and so I, I took this approach of, of just sheer um, curiosity with her, and I was like, wow, I um, can, cannot really navigate or manage or hear two kids regularly talking to me. Tell me what that's like when all five are talking to you, right? So it's finding that place of curiosity that can, can begin to build the uh, space of belonging. Being curious, I think, is one of the, the best tools I've ever been able to use to create that inclusivity. It, it eliminates the judgment. It's like, wow, I just, I wouldn't even know what that's like. And so I'll tell you a, a recent story. We had um, an individual that we are seeing um, through cyber school. And um, so there, it's an online visit. And some regulation or rule changed. And now all related services have to happen in person. And we can either go to the home or they can come to us. And this family does not, um, there's no driver, transportation is very limited. And so we had regularly told them, well, we can go to your house. And there's a lot of reasons, no, 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 make appointments. They wouldn't answer the door, you know, all of that. Um, so I just, instead of like doing the whole like, hey, we have to get these, I have to report if you're not showing up, that kind of thing. I just started talking to them about their day, right? Like, so I said to dad, like, dad, it feels like maybe we're not hitting the right time of day for you. Like, can you tell me a little bit about what your day looks like? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot going on. So we talked about the day. We kind of did like an occupational profile. And so over the course of three weeks, I just, with curiosity, asked him about him, his life, his experience with his kids. And uh, finally, he, he said, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think it could be all right. He's like, I, I know we're going to be home at this day at this time. And actually, another one of my therapists was going in. And I said, well, I'm going to be sending Annie in. And he says, great. And Annie came back, and her eyes were huge. And she said, there are 8,000 cameras in every room watching every outside part of the house. I don't know what they're afraid. So they're afraid of the zombie apocalypse. And so every, they like lock up, they have like, like their whole basement is filled with food and supplies and they have video cameras to see every, where people are coming in and coming and going. Look, it, they didn't trust me yet. They didn't trust any of us yet. I could have been a zombie. Um, and, and that's a very real fear to them. It's also now a very real fear to Annie, unfortunately, um, after going in there. But, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just about being able to be curious, build that trust, and then to get invited into the space. You know, it was like incredible to hear that they are just so private, that they're so afraid of these outside bodies coming in, and that they're watching constantly, and that we were able to go in. Um, it was like a really, like, it gives you this invigoration like wow we were we were able to get there um, you know I I'm I don't know that Annie would say the same thing she's not really excited about going back she's kind of afraid of all the cameras but um, you know I it's it is it's being there in that place of curiosity of caution of non-judgmental and not giving up you know I think our greatest tool often too is our occupational profile how often do people actually get asked what their day is like, what they do throughout their day? Just tell me what it looks like from the really mundane, boring, brushing your teeth to the like exciting, I almost got in a car accident kind of thing. Um, and so I, I think by nature we build inclusivity and belonging through that. Uh, 
I am wondering if you could speak to or what, where you would advise people to go for maybe people you've inspired in the last 24 hours on AOTA's website um, to think about the not-for-profit not organization that you've started and where they might find more resources if they are interested in doing the same. It's a great question. So um, I would say that if you went on to the website, um, the best thing you can do is to email the customer service and say, I have an interest in need more resources in this area. Can you point me in the direction? AOTA is and always has been a very people forward organization. Um, a lot of the, the, the benefit in the membership is this idea that there's so much knowledge and experience that exists in the staff and they're so ready and willing to share it. That yes, there's resources on there, and you could find them, and you could do the search, but um, I'm impatient. So what I often do is I just email the customer email address and say, can you just connect me to the right person, and they will. That's, I think, the fastest way. The other thing is, is like, I always look, um, you know, like the board members, our email addresses are on there, our bios are on there, like Victoria, um, Garcia Wilburn was just elected into the um, state house in Indiana. She's now a state rep. Um, and she's done incredible, like, uh, nonprofit work and building nonprofits, and it's all in her bio. I would email her. Like, everybody's really responsive to email. So, like, when you have specific questions or specific resources you're looking for, send an email. Someone will respond. And I can't, I know, like some people love the web, new website, some people hate the new website. I don't really want to debate the website. Uh, what I will say is I am not tech savvy, so I'm not sure you could build a website that I could ever find anything on. But that's another reason that I'm always a go-to email, because I'll put in search, and the next thing you know, I'll be like, I'm not, I'll be in like Wolf It or something. It won't, it won't happen for me. So that's what I'd recommend. Um, so, as new students, one of the first assignments we are given when we come into the program is what we've been told is our elevator definition, meaning explain to somebody in 30 seconds or less who has no idea what occupational therapy is, what occupational therapy is. So as the president of our organization, I would regret if I didn't ask, what is your elevator definition <laughs> of occupational therapy? Oh, wow. Uh, it's been a long time since I've had to do that assignment. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. I was at the 100th anniversary uh, in Philadelphia, and I had to, we, we had a cake, Pitt had a cake, and for our reception we were having, and I had to go to the car to get the cake, and I, I get out, and I've got this huge cake in my hand, and I'm in an elevator. And these two men that worked in the garage came in, and they're like, what's your cake for? And I'm like, oh, we're celebrating 100 years of occupational therapy. And they're like, what's occupational therapy? And I was like, wait a minute. I'm giving my elevator speech in an elevator. Like, someone film this. It's amazing. You know, I, I think that my elevator pitch really actually changes depending on who I talk to. But the key pieces that I always think are important to include are the terms meaningful and purposeful. I might not use the term occupation, but I say, look, there's things that you need to do every day. There's things that you actually want to do every day. And there's things that people expect you to do every day. And, and sometimes you get it done. And you get it done well. And sometimes you don't. And my job is to make sure that as many days as possible, you're doing as many things as, as possible well. And then most people are like, well, who doesn't need it then? Because like, I had a terrible day yesterday. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Here's my card. Uh, 
I wrote it down. So <laughs> you've talked a lot about judgment and how, as an OT, we need to take a step back and not allow our personal ethics and opinions affect our relationship with clients. But a topic we have been talking about is self-stigma and public stigma that can affect our own beliefs as well as the clients. So how do you work through these issues to ensure you provide the best care for your client? So, you know, I, I think it's, it becomes much like m m occupational therapy becomes very individualized. But again, I, I go back to that place of curiosity. Being curious was never what created stigma. It was determining outside of curiosity that built stigma, right? It was never the, the idea of, oh my goodness, I wonder why you are in that wheelchair that made you less than. It was, oh, the assumption that you must be less than and that's why you're in the wheelchair that created the stigma. If you can live in a space of curiosity, then it actually helps you to not just eliminate your own bias and stigma that you might perceive, but also the individual's stigma. In sharing my narrative, there's a great amount of power. And in doing that with someone who doesn't tell me my choice was good or bad, just that they wanted to hear about it, can really start to minimize that experience of stigma in themselves. And the more willing that you are to do that with each individual client, the more likely it is that that will be something they can share and spread. They can take your curiosity with them and they can become curious. I remember working with a woman who, the woman I had just spoken about, um, she had five children. She was referred to me when she was pregnant and um, she didn't come. She came to me afterwards. The baby was 18 months old. The baby was of mixed race and she was from a rural family that did not believe that that was appropriate and had some pretty extreme racial biases. And she said to me, I don't know what to do, right? Because, like, this kid's half me, and so I guess I love that half, but this kid's half something else, and you know. So what am I supposed to do with her? Here's this beautiful 18-month-old little girl who's smiling, and she's giggling, and she's cooing, and she's doing all the things that developmentally she should do. And my husband and I had been trying to have a baby for so long, and I thought, you can't figure out how to love this child and all I want to do is take her home. This would, this would fulfill our lives. This is what we've been wanting for so long, right? I couldn't go there with that. I needed to know why. I said, wow, why? I'm so sorry that that's what you feel. Why do you feel that way? Why can't you love the other part of her? Well, you know, because I grew up and you just, you don't, you don't have a baby with someone that's not the same color as you. And I said, oh, wow. I, I grew up in a very diverse area. I grew up very urban. And so it was very common to have friends and, and family members that were in biracial relationships or were multiracial in, in ethnicity and, and, and race. I, I said, this is just a new experience for me. Tell me, like, why? Um, what, like, what is it that, and she was like, well, I don't, well, I don't know, we just, we're just different. I said, oh, okay, I can, I can understand that. So, so can you tell me a little bit about what part of her you love and what part of her you don't? Because you said that there's a part of, you love part of her and you don't, like, what is it that you love about her and what is it that you don't love about her? Right? And through that, she actually got to really come to a place where I wasn't stigmatizing her for having a biracial baby. I actually wanted to steal her baby. Um, I didn't tell her that. Probably would have been not appropriate, right? But by asking those questions, she got to see the cycle in which she lives in, the place that created that stigma in her. And, and I didn't judge her for it. I don't, she didn't walk, I can't tell you she walked out that day loving her baby or suddenly saying, you know what, it's fine that she's biracial. I, I, I don't know that she did that, 
But what I do know is that she did get to interact with someone who wasn't judging her or her baby because that child was biracial. And so to meet one person, to interact with one person without a stigma that you believe in or a stigma that you think is placed on you is an opportunity to chip away at the overall experience for that person. She also revealed to me in later sessions that what she really hated about that child wasn't that the child was biracial, but was that she didn't have money for heroin, so she slept with her drug dealer and got pregnant. And she hated that she was able to create perfection out of a need for a substance. She didn't hate the baby at all. She hated what she did and that it could create something so beautiful. She said, how could I make such a terrible choice and yet get such a beautiful gift from it? She also later revealed that she wasn't doing heroin anymore. She was coming to the methadone clinic every day. But she was still using crack cocaine pretty regularly. She was finally ready to tell me the things that she thought everybody was going to judge her and that was making her live the stigma that she felt every day. Being able to express those helps speaking it out loud takes away the stigma. And so I, I gave her a place to eliminate her self-stigma because she could say it out loud. And I think those are the ways that we can help. It's, it's a person by person. It's, it's society by society. It's stepping out of your child, stepping out of their car at the elementary school and saying, Mama's going to the meth clinic and waving and smiling and being okay with people asking me the questions and my daughter being okay with people saying, your mom goes to the meth clinic? And she's like, yeah, she hangs out with all the pregnant moms there, right? Like, it's, it's just making the statements. Other questions? Anything? <laughs> All right. Um, if there's not any more questions, uh, we definitely want to thank Dr. Stover for being here. Let's give her a big round of applause. Okay, thank you all for, for coming. Have a safe travels, have safe travels back wherever you're coming from, or if you're heading over to class, have safe travels over there. Um, if you, uh, just a couple announcements, if you are a PTE member, stick around, we'll get a photo. Um, and if you are a faculty member also, stick around, we'll get a photo. Um, otherwise, you are free to go. Thank you. <laughs>